action. One of the things that I love about the word when it talks about faith and where to be a people of faith is Abraham, he did one of these things. He, he learned something that God did. God called those things that were not as though they already were. And this is what faith does. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you're lacking, where you don't have enough, you, what, what your words need to sound like is what it doesn't look like. Your words need to sound different than what the situation looks like if you expect to find yourself in a different place than where you're at. You need to call those things that be not as though they were. And I will go ahead and share this quick story. I don't know uh, if this, this is something that Pastor Keith Moore has actually shared in many uh, of his messages. I remember it from one, I believe, in one of his series called Thanksgiving Victory. And it goes right in line with what he's been talking about. Um, I believe last week, was there, was last week, did he give an example of, of um, yeah, of smoking, right? Of him not being able to handle smoke. And I'm like, that's funny. Some, a lot of his examples deal with smoking. But there was this other one. There was this other one where this guy came up to him after a service, and I forget what it was about, and he didn't say, he's saying, uh, Pastor, like, I want to quit smoking. I've been smoking for years, and I want to quit, but I just can't. I can't quit. I've tried. I've tried this. I've tried that, and I just can't quit. And I'm paraphrasing a lot here because it was a long time ago when I heard it, but he said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something to do, and if you do it, you'll stop smoking, Okay. He was like, okay, I've done everything, though. I've tried everything, and I can't quit. I just can't quit. He said, stop, stop saying that. Stop talking. Stop talking. Stop saying I can't quit, right? And he said, here's what I want you to do. Every time you pick up a cigarette, I want you to say, I'm free from cigarettes. I'm free from nicotine. I'm free. Every, time, every time you take a drag of that, I want you to say, I am free from the addiction of nicotine. I'm free from cigarettes. He said, but I'll be smoking. He said, yeah, you're already smoking. But what you're saying, you're calling those things that are not as though they already were, okay? And so that's what faith is. He said, but I'll be smoking, and you're already doing that. So go ahead and start saying something different. Every time you light it up, thank you, Lord, I'm free from cigarettes. This sounds crazy to the world. You sound like a mad person. And he said a few weeks of doing this, and he was walking down the street, and he lit up, and it just hit him. like, I don't need this anymore. I don't want this. And he put it down and he never smoked after that again because he chose to call those things that were not as though they already were. And so if you find yourself in a spot tonight, uh, your words need to start sounding like where you want to go instead of where you're at. Amen. Amen. And so when we, when we talk about God's word, when we say these things, if it doesn't feel true right now, you got to understand that we're on our way somewhere. We're on our way here, right? Say this after me. Say, I'm increasing. More and more, me and my children. I'm increasing more and more, me and my children. We're increasing, aren't we? We're increasing. We're coming out. We're coming up. We're increasing. Why, why are we doing this? Listen, we're blessed so that we can be a blessing. We said it around here a lot, but it's really a selfish thing to think, I really just need enough for me and my family. I just need enough for me and my four I mean, that's selfish at the heart of it because if you have enough just for you and your four, what do you have left for anyone else? You can't be generous when you just have barely enough. And we're a generous people, aren't we? All right, let's say this declaration together as we give. As you know, you can give online and you can also uh, give on the, with the offering envelopes. The ushers are going to come. Are you all ready? Here we go. Father, today we pause to reflect and say thank you. We recognize you as the source of every good gift in our lives. Right now, we come into agreement with you and say, in this house and in my house, there is provision for your vision. In no way will we be limited to serve our generation. We purpose to be an extension of your goodness so others would experience you. Right now, we ask you for wisdom and to direct our steps into a place of overflow. Our lives will bring increase to your kingdom. Amen. Let's give.
It's good to be in God's house tonight. Amen. I mean, what you just heard, what I just heard, what we all just heard was worth us coming to church tonight for. Just that and that alone. Amen. Amen. How many of you believe that God has more for us tonight? Words of life. Words of life. Man, it, I'm telling you, I need to shut up because it's hard to not preach right now. Hallelujah. Number one, I can't go on without saying this, and it'll be something that I know pastors will share on Sunday, but I'm going to just tell it if that's okay, Kyle. So before service, we had 25, 30 kids. Was there that many? I don't know. Anyway, around 20 kids on the ball court, uh, kids that uh, aren't our kids around here. Kyle went down, preached the gospel to them, and every single one of them gave their heart to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The hearts are ready. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy. They're ripe for the picking. The harvest is ripe. Glory to God. And we say all the time around here in this house and on our premises, it's easy to receive from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The spirit of faith. Okay. I want to... Um, I was going to do some nuggets. How many of y'all like chicken nuggets? Well, I was just going to give some nuggets uh, from our previous uh, session. <laughs> Not so much over here in this section. Uh, but some previous nuggets from um, our sessions that we've been doing on Wednesday night. I'm going to save that, okay, um, for, for another night. But I want to set up uh, the teaching for tonight. How many of you guys um, have gleaned? gleaned words of truth that you're putting into practice. Amen. I love the nods. I love, yes. And uh, you know what? This is the truth. Um, we never, we never outgrow. We never outgrow the truth of God's word. You know, and we get really messed up when we're looking for something deep. Do you understand? What we need is to hear and to hear and to hear and to apply and apply because the word I heard last week, the word I heard last year is still the same word I need to be hearing because I still need to be applying. Amen. And so I'm so thankful. I'm just so thankful for his word. I'm thankful for the, the teaching of his word. And one of the things that uh, Brother Joe Morris, he, he made this comment. He said, every single day, and this is a man who uh, has preached the gospel for many years. Uh, but, but he said, never a day goes by that he doesn't listen to at least two or three of Brother Hagin's messages uh, and he said, and these are messages that honestly I could preach word for word because I've heard them so many times. But what is he doing? He's feeding and he's feeding and he's feeding because what fed me uh, yesterday, I still need fed today. Amen. So we don't want to grow weary in thinking I've heard that or I need to heard, hear something new. No, what I need to do is apply what I've heard. That's what I need to do is apply. So we're doers in this house. Amen? Amen. So in this series of uh, the Word of Power, I believe this is our fifth week uh, so far, and we're going to finish out the, mon the month of March here. But I didn't give this to you, Brad, but I'm going to be uh, looking at Mark 11, uh, 23 and 24 here. Y'all can turn to that. You got Bibles? Let me hear those pages. Oh, oh, looky, he, he has it. Thank you, Brad. All right, so it says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, say, say, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. You know, I believe that we have probably, uh, all of us in here, read this passage many times um, before, but how many times have we just skipped over it? Like we're just not real confident of this. Anybody? Um, but I'm so thankful that we have a choice, that I have a choice to look at this word and to be able to say, okay, I need some light here. 
thank God for the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. But I'm not going to disregard this word just because uh, it may not be functioning and operating in my life right now. God's trying to get something to us. He's trying, and it's important uh, for us to have the things of God. We have to do things our way. I, excuse me. Ha! Ha! His way. His way. Rewind. In order to walk in the things of God, we must do things his way. How many of you know he knows more than we know? Amen. And so many, many times we're trying to get things from God in our own way and we come up short. But if we'll do things his way, if we'll come into line with what he says, then we'll have the results that Jesus had. Amen. So in this verse where it says, I, uh, oh, sorry about that. I say unto you that whosoever, say I'm a whosoever. So you're qualified here. Shall say unto this mountain, and mountains are obstacles, right? And he does not tell us that we should pray and ask God to remove this mountain. And yet, many, many Christians spend their entire Christian life asking God to take away the obstacles that are in their life. And this is not what the Word says. The Word, God tells us, Jesus tells us that we are to say to the mountain. So there's times that we are to say and there's times that we are to pray. Amen. And we need to, we need to be uh, recognizing the difference, and we need to be doing it God's way. So if there's an obstacle, if there's a mountain in your life, God said for you to speak to it. And what are we going to say to it? We're going to say what God says about it. Amen. Amen. And it says that if um, you shall not doubt and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So it's important here that we not doubt in our heart. Amen. Amen. We don't doubt in our heart. So what is it? What if I come against, uh, come up against something and I'm not fully persuaded about God's will? If I'm not fully persuaded in my heart, what do I need? I need more of God's word. I need more of God's word. Don't just sit and put up with the doubt that is in your heart. Go to the place where you can get fully persuaded that it is God's will. And then when you speak to that thing, it'll go. Amen. All right. And then verse 34. Uh, 24 it says therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them so is this prayer or is this saying it's prayer whatsoever things you desire when you pray who are we praying to we're praying to the father so he's talking about desires here. He's not talking about obstacles that need to be removed. He's talking about desires. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe. So when are we to believe that we receive? When, when are we to believe that we receive? When we receive, when we pray. When we pray. So, so whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So a lot of times we pray too early. A lot of times we, we come to the Father with, with uh, desires. And we're, we're asking him, but again, we're not fully persuaded. Amen. And so don't give up, just uh, again, go to the place, go to the word where it talks about uh, what, what you're desiring or what you have uh, need of and get his word on it. And, and, and so that we can be fully persuaded when we ask. Amen. So we remove obstacles with what we say 
and we get our desires met by praying to the Father, the one from whom all good things come from. Amen? Amen. So that uh, part of that may be, you're going to hear it uh, tonight uh, in this session, but uh, this, is what, this is what he's going to be talking about, uh, asking or commanding. And it's, it's imperative that we know the difference and, again, that we do things his way. Amen? All right. I was up in uh, Milwaukee uh, a while back and uh, checking into the hotel and this lady was checking in beside me and, and uh, I know she glanced over at me and then she went back and then she just turned and looked at me. She said, ah, Brother Keith, I've got you in my purse. I've got you in my purse. <laughs> so she had me on her phone, I think it was, in her purse and uh, thank God. <laughs> that we can be preaching all over the place. Right. Did you hear about what's uh, Newfoundland yeah. and Nigeria? Right. Yeah. And aren't we thankful for that? I mean, yeah. previous generations have not had these tools. Right. So the word is going out. Yes. And uh, there are previous messages to this, and you can get them. Uh, all it'll take is uh, some, t some of your time. But we've been seeing uh, uh, the... The series that preceded this one was called Faith in the Power. And now we're talking about how that power is released. How, what causes it to manifest. And we see Jesus walked in power. Not just empty talk. And not just talk only. But there were manifestations of power healings, deliverances, miracles, people raised from the dead. Everybody say power. 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 Th this is not just thinking. This is uh, divine energy, divine life and power that changes situations, material situations, that human beings cannot change. Power. And so we decided in the last series, we have faith in the power. Yes, we, do. we believe in the power. Because it talks about a whole group of religious people in the last days that would have a form of godliness, but they would do what? Deny, Deny the power. What does that mean? They, the power bothers them. They don't want to be around any manifestations of the power. They just want to be religious. We don't want to be like that. I said, we don't want to be like that. Yes. We believe in the power. Yes. We want power manifestations yes. in our life yes. and around us. And God has never changed. He has never changed. So what is the connection between the power and its release, the power and its manifestation? Well, in uh, Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 22 Luke 4.22, it says, They all bear him witness, Jesus that is, and they wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. His words caused them to wonder. Then in verse 32 of the same chapter, it said, And they were astonished at his doctrine. Now this is a, a very strong word. It didn't just say they were intrigued. Huh? It didn't, say, it didn't just say it caught their attention. They were what? Astonished. Astonished means your mouth is hanging open. And you're just going, whoa. At what? At, at, at his teaching, for his word was with power. When he spoke, you'd feel like he'd knock you off the chair sometime. And sometimes it would. What do you mean? Do you remember when they actually came to get Jesus? Remember when they came to get him? And he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus. What did he say? I am. I am. What happened? Man, they all, they all hit the ground. They all fell back on themselves. That is a powerful word. Somebody say his word. 
was with power. Now, this shouldn't be astounding to us if we know a little bit, a little bit about God, a little bit about the Word, because the Scripture tells us that the very planets themselves have come into existence by the Word of His power. And that even at this present moment, the Scripture said, all things are upheld by the word of his power. What does that mean? What keeps the sun burning? What keeps gravity working? Huh? What keeps your heart beating and your brain synapses firing? Huh? Do not give the credit to Mother Nature. No such thing as Mother Nature. There's nature. Where did nature come from? It came from God. And, and even though nature is in a fallen, twisted state because of curse and sin, you can still see amazing things. Won't it be wonderful when we see it restored? Everything the way God originally created it. I'm looking forward to it. Are you? Yes. And whether we're going to have some good weather. Yeah. <laughs> huh? It'll be no more. Too hot, too cold, no more earthquakes, no more tsunamis, no more tornadoes. Somebody said, why would you say that? Because all of that's the result of the fall. No more. No more hurricanes. No more. Why? The Bible tells us in Romans 8, that right now the earth is groaning and travailing. The planet itself is groaning. Why? It's been affected by the curse and sin, and it's actually dying. And when people talk about saving the planet, this planet will not be saved, ultimately. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, wherein is no curse, Hallelujah. And you and I are going to get to experience these things. Are you excited about it at all? And you want to tell everybody you can to take them with you. Everybody you can. Invite people to church. Invite people to talk about these things. Invite people. Be open. Make an acquaintance. Make a friend. Make a convert. Make a disciple. Huh? You first start out just, just making a friend, just, just showing that you care about somebody, you care about their life. But God's put a lot in you is what I'm saying. He's put a lot in you. He wants a return on investment. <laughs> let, let it come out. He wants to use some of what he's put in you to help put it in somebody else. Every good thing the Lord gives you is ultimately for you to give away and help somebody else as well. We're not stingy with the goodness of God. We share. Uh, he sa it says they were astonished at his word, for his word was with power. And uh, there was a wrong spirit that was there in the synagogue. And verse 35, Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold your peace. Or we might say, sh you know, be quiet, shut up, and come out of him. Verse 36, they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So we know there were power manifestations in the life and ministry of Jesus. You see them, we're reading about them, we're talking about them. How were they manifested? Primarily when he spoke. Can you see this church? Yes. It was when he spoke. That's when the power manifested. That's not a coincidence that it happened at the same time he spoke. The speaking of the words was what caused the manifestation. It goes on to say in the same chapter. It says, uh, verse 38 
he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. They besought him for her. And Jesus stood over her and he did what? So they asked him to minister to their relative, Peter's mother-in-law. And so he goes in there where she is and she's laid out delirious, I suppose, with fever in a bad way. He stood over her. And what did he do? He rebuked the fever or he spoke to the fever. Is this prayer? This is not prayer. He's not talking to the father about this. He's not talking to Peter's mother-in-law. He's not talking to anybody else in the house. Who's he talking to? A fever. Now, most church-going people don't think like this. If most church-going people, if they said, man, I've been running a high fever, is the usual response from their fellow church-goers to say, well, have you spoken to it? No. <laughs> no. But that's because people have gotten so far away from the Word. And, and the Word has been replaced by religious tradition. The t- traditions of men have made the Word of God of none effect. Very dangerous thing. But you and I can get back to the Word. I said we can get back to the Word and get back to some results. Huh? Get back. Get back to some power manifestations in our life. I know years ago when I read that and it dawned on me, I realized it said he rebuked the fever and I thought, whoa, 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 whoa now. He's not praying. He's not asking the Father to do something here. He's not even talking to the Father. He's not even talking to this woman. He's talking to a fever, a fever. And I thought, can a fever hear? And I read the next phrase, and it left her. (laughs) And I thought, yep, (laughs) fevers can hear. And if fevers can hear, tumors can hear. If fevers can hear, cancer can hear. If fevers can hear, AIDS can hear. If fever can hear, COVID can hear. If fever can hear, your immune system can hear. Our words are so vital, so important. We talked about last week how the scripture said life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I gave an example of how I had said some things that were opening up problems for me. And I didn't realize it back years ago. And and nobody has arrived at at perfect confession yet. (laughs) Right? And so you want to keep a watch over the door of your lips. Why? Because you don't want to give the enemy anything he can work with against you in your life. And you do want to give the Holy Spirit and the holy angels free access. Right? To work in your life. Everybody said out loud, Lord, Lord, set a watch watch at the door of my mouth mouth. and and alert me to anything I should not be saying. And all that I should be saying. saying. Hallelujah. All right. Well, don't be surprised if like those guys that Tom uh, read the testimony, you may be down to 50% (laughs) of your normal speaking. But for real, this needs to happen till we get it sorted. (laughs) Uh, Go with me, if you would, please, to to a, a Luke Nine, we're there in uh, in Luke four. Just over to Luke nine, fifty one, I believe it is. Nine fifty one. It came to pass when the time was come that he Jesus should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, and they did not receive him. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? (laughs) Now, why in the world 
Would they say that? Why would they say that? Well, certainly this is in the Old Testament. And Elijah uh, spoke and fire came down and consumed those uh, 50 and then another 50. And, uh, but notice the word they used, wilt thou that we what? Command. Is this prayer? They're not talking about praying anything. Do, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from Do they believe in the power of God? Yes. Why do they think this way? Why? Because they live with Jesus. They travel with Jesus. And he speaks to trees. He speaks to fevers. He speaks to wind and waves. He speaks to wrong spirits and shuts them down. He speaks to the dead. And they raise. Is that right? And this, this has gotten, they, they've seen it. They've experienced it over and over again. And it has gotten into them to where they fully believe they can do it. And not only do they believe that they can do it, if you read this in the next chapter, it talks about that he, he authorized his, uh, the, the 12 and then also the 70 and he sent them out. And they had authority over every unclean spirit to cast them out and they had authority over every disease and every sickness. So they are walking in this. So it's not a stretch to go from there to calling a little fire down. Now, see, this sounds fantastical to most church-going people. They're like, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, this is, you know, that's fantasy. No, it's Bible. I said it's Bible. But what I want to draw your attention to is how were they going to do it? Command it. Everybody say command. Do you see the word? They said, do you want us to what? Command. Command fire to come down from heaven. Here is where much of the church is falling short. They are doing no commanding. None. <laughs> None. Religion makes people beggars. The authority of the name of Jesus will make you a commander. One who commands. Amen. Jesus commanded that fever to leave, and it did. Amen. Right? Amen. That wasn't prayer. Go with me to Mark, the uh, 11th chapter. This is a passage that some of you are familiar with the great faith passage, Mark 11, 22, and 23, and 24. But, uh, Notice a, a big distinction is made here. Mark 11, the setting is that Jesus had spoken to a fig tree and he had commanded it and said, no man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. That's not a request. <laughs> Y'all with me? That's not a request. It's a command. And so the next day when they came by and saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, they were amazed. And they said, look, Lord, look, that tree you spoke to, it's dried up. And he takes that as an opportunity to teach them and tells them they can do it too. In fact, you got your place there in Mark? Hold that. Go back to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, which is Matthew's account of the same happening. Matthew 21, 20. The disciples saw it and they marveled and said, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say to you, if you have faith... And doubt not, 
you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree. Stop right here. Is he telling them they could do that? Yes. yes. And this is, is such a big deal. Many church going people, when you say that Jesus spoke and power was released, they, they believe that. They'll receive that, but they immediately say, yeah, but that's Jesus. Implying he could do that, nobody else. But it's not true. The 12 did it. The 70 did it. You see it continuing through the book of Acts. Is that right? With pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and lay people. And there's record of it continuing to happen through every generation right up to today. So it's not true that Jesus was the only one that did it. He said others could do it. Can, are we reading this? Yes. If you have faith, because they're marveling about him speaking to that fig tree and it drying up. And he said, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you will say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Is he talking about making a request? No. He's talking about making a command. He, he didn't request anything of the Father about that tree. He didn't request anything from the tree. He told it what to do. He commanded it what to do with, with authority and with boldness. And so he's telling them, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. And in verse 22, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer. Now he's talking about another thing. All things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now he is talking about making a request. But he's, di he's distinguishing saying from praying. Hmm? Commanding from requesting. Go back to Mark 11, please. Mark 11 and 22. Mark's account of this. He said, Jesus answering and said to them, have faith in God. You have faith in God. Or the margin says, the God kind of faith. You, he, he's telling them, you do this. Well, if this was something that only Jesus could do, it shouldn't even be in here. Because right. okay. there was all kind of things that he did that are not recorded. Mm -hmm. Right? And it would just be safer than me and you wouldn't be trying to do something right. that we shouldn't be trying to do. The reason it's here is because it's for our benefit. He wants us stirred. He wants us inspired. He showed us how to do it. And now he's telling us, you do it too. Do what? Command. Somebody say command. 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 Jesus answering them said, have faith in God. Verse 23, for verily I say to you that whoever will say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Now is that prayer? No. Is that prayer? No. no addressing the Father. Is this a request? No. There's no request here. He's just like Jesus spoke to the uh, uh, fever. He spoke to the tree. He spoke to the wind and waves. This is speaking to the mountain. Yeah. Who, who are you talking to? The mountain. And if you will say it and not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things that you say shall come to pass, you will have whatsoever he says. It's not just saying it that makes it happen. Somebody said, well, I said it and it didn't happen. He didn't, just, he didn't say it would happen just because you said it. Hmm? He didn't say everything you say would happen. That's obvious. What, what, what do you have to do? You, you have to be fully convinced and not doubt and fully expect that what you say happens. Right? So it's not just saying, it's believing and saying. 
Then he goes on to verse 24, he says, Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire, now see, this is a different thing. Because the mountain represents a big obstacle, a big block. That's something you don't desire. That's something you don't want, something that's in your way, you don't desire it. Well, when you don't desire it, you don't make requests. You make commands. If it's something bad, you don't make any requests. You make commands. If it's something good, that comes from above. You don't give him commands. You make requests. Right? We talking to God, we don't make demands. Right? You talking to the enemy, you don't make requests. That was worth you coming to the service, right? Right there. Huh? I said, if you're talking to God, you don't make any demands. You make requests. You talking to the enemy, you don't make any requests. You make demands. Depends on who you're talking to or what you're talking to. Therefore, I say to you, what things soever you desire when you pray, this is prayer, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So they're saying and there's praying. And you don't want to be praying when you should be saying. And you don't want to be saying when you should be praying. Go with me, please, to the book of John. John, the 14th chapter. John chapter 14. And we'll begin in verse 8. John 14, 8. Philip said to the Lord, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. You know that's God's will for us today too, that when people see us, they see the Master, and if they see Him, they see the Father. That's exactly the same plan. We are to be living witnesses. That means not just what you say is a witness, that is part of your witness, but what you are. You you are a witness 24-7. And uh, he said, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So how, how do you say, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now, I want you to notice this phrase, the works. This is what we've been talking about the whole time. Did Jesus have power manifestations in his life and in his ministry? He called those power manifestations the works. And you'll find this phrase keeps being repeated in this passage. That's what he's talking about here is the works. He's talking about how he did them. And he's he's about to talk about how we do them. So you do not want to snooze through this. (laughs) Jesus is telling us how he did the works. And how we are to do them. How did he do them? He said, I didn't speak of myself. And and, and he didn't do it of himself. He said, the Father in me, he does the works. If you look at John 5 and 8 and here and other places, Jesus kept on saying, I can do nothing of myself. I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see him do. Um, we actually, the Lord gave, gave me four messages on this part of this. 
back a few weeks ago at Southwest Believers Convention. And those messages are will be available on the website um, if you want to go listen to them, watch them. It's called The Source of Faith. The Source of Faith. And it answers uh, some questions about have you ever prayed and it didn't happen? Have you ever commanded and it didn't come to pass? Well, why? There are reasons why. And we, got in, we go into detail on that. So let me encourage you, that's, that, that'll be available to you. But that's what he's saying here. He, Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. He is telling us he is completely dependent on his communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit in his life. And he doesn't just say everything that crosses his mind. He doesn't just do anything that presents and makes itself available. He only says what he hears the Father give him to say, and he only does what the Father directs him to do. But because of that, everything he said came to pass, and everything he did worked. And so if we're going to see success in our life, the servant or the student is not above the teacher not above the master, we'll have to do it the very same way that he did it. So uh, he said, the father who dwells in me, he does the works. Keep reading. The works. Believe me that I'm in the father and the father in me or else believe me for the very works sake. Is he, is he continuing to talk about the works, the works? the works, which are the power manifestations. Keep going. Verily, verily, I say to you, Jesus said, he that believes on me, the what? The what? The works that I do, shall he do also. Do you believe this, child of God? Do you believe this? See, this is the same thing he told the 12 about that tree. If you have faith and won't doubt, now, uh, not only can you do this. In other words, he's telling, he's telling them, you can do this too. Most of the church world does not believe what we're talking about right now. They put everything Jesus said and did in a category unattainable to us. They imply or outright say that he did it as God. And that's not what the Bible said. He was and is God. But he emptied himself of his mighty weight and power and glory and became like other men. And did things as a man, showing us how to do it. Then he told us things like this. If you believe on me, how many would raise a hand and say, I believe on him? I said, how many would lift up a hand and say, I believe on the Lord Jesus. So is he talking to you? Yes. Then he said to you, the works that I do, shall you do also. Amen. Do you believe that? Most people don't. I'm looking around. Do you believe that the master told you because you believe on him Amen. that the same works he did? He did some works, y'all. Huh? Did he do some works? He did some works. The same works he did, he said, I do, you will do also. And... Greater works than these. Why? Because if he would have stayed, things would have just kept multiplying, getting bigger and bigger. But he was on a short track to the cross. He just showed us how to do it. Yeah. Then he paid the price. Then he left. But because we're here for, you know, not just 30 years, we're here for 50 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years, Right? And all of us, things should keep going. Things should keep building. And it's not just us doing it. It's him doing it in us. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Just like what he said about the Father, I, I should say, you should say, I can of my own self do nothing. But I ain't by myself. Yeah. I'm not by myself. The greater one is living on the inside of me. The power and authority in the name above all names has been given to me and to you. 
That authority has been given to us and we should be making some commands. We should be making some commandments. Not just requests, but also some commands. Not of God, but of the enemy. And you see, he, he says exactly how to do it in this next verse. Verse 12, let's read it again. He said, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, you said you do, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. Look at verse 13. And, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Now here's where it gets a little confusing because this looks like request. But is this prayer? We need to, we need to settle this one. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. He's not talking about asking the Father. He's talking about I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But this is not a request of the Father. This is not prayer. Read the next verse, verse 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. <laughs> Does this seem big to your spirit? that the master would tell us this. Hold your place here. Go to the 16th chapter. John 16. He had been talking about the Holy Spirit. And look down in verse uh, 26. Well, excuse me. Um, back up a little bit to verse 23. Verse 23. John 16, 23. Read this first phrase with me. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. I thought he just got through saying. What do you, whatever you ask in my name. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. Verily, I say to you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Is this prayer? Absolutely prayer. This is prayer. You're, ask, you're, you're praying to the Father in Jesus' name. And he said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Well, what does he mean? In that day you shall ask me nothing. He just got through saying in chapter 14, you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here he's talking about he will give it to you. These passages are not the same. They are not duplicate. Keep reading. Hitherto, up till now, have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. So this is not talking about dealing with bad things. This is talking about getting good things. Things that make you joyful. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This is prayer. And if you just read this and verse chapter 14, you'd think, well, they, they contradict each other. No, they don't. No Bible passage contradicts itself. If you think you found one that does, you just found something you don't understand. I assure you. And as soon as you do understand it, you'll go, oh, that's what he's talking about. You have to look at the word ask. The word ask here, if you look it up, the, the Greek word that's translated there, one definition is, to demand. 
Did you hear that? To demand. Now, don't say it always means demand because that wouldn't be true either. You, this word appears a lot of times in the New Testament. You have to look at the context to see which way it's being used. Listen to uh, uh, Luke 22, excuse me, 23 and 23. Luke 23, you don't have to turn there, but they'll put it on the screen. Luke 23, 23. It said they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. That word requiring is the same word that's translated if you ask anything in my name. Same word. So you could say if you require anything in my name. And the NIV says it like this, with loud shouts, they instantly demanded that he be crucified. That word demand, that's the same word that's in, in John 14 that says, if you demand anything in my name, I will do it. Same word. Don't, don't take my word for it. Look it up. And verse 24 says, so Pilate decided to grant their demand. Is there a difference between a demand and a request? Yes. Oh, yeah. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, 1 Corinthians 1.22, it said the Jews require a sign. That word require, same word, translated in, in John 14, ask. So you're doing no damage or harm to the text to translate it consistently with other places in the same New Testament. Go back and read John 14 now with me. And let's read it that way. John 14. And 12. Verse 12. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do. Is Jesus talking about prayer? No. No. He's talking about doing the works. That's the context. The works I do, he'll do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father, and he, then he tells us how to do the works, how we will do the same works he did. Whatsoever you shall demand. Come on, can you see this? That's the same word I said was translated demand or require in those other passages. Whatever you will demand in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glory. You're not demanding of the Son. You're not demanding of the Father. You're demanding of the situation. That's how you do the works. Is that how Jesus did the works? That's exactly how he did them. He made commands. He made demands. Verse 14. He said it again, if you shall ask, that same word translated require or demand, if you demand anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, Lou and Nida, the authorities on Greek language says that includes to the point of demanding. Uh, Cattell, they're you know, authority on the language. They said it has a, uh, one of the senses is to demand, to demand. Then it makes sense when you read John 14 and he says, in that day you'll ask me nothing. Well, he's not talking about this. He's not talking about doing the works. He's talking about prayer. Consistent with Mark 11. Consistent with Matthew 21. There's a time to pray and there's a time to command. Can you see that? And do we see these kind of things happening in the book of Acts? Were there times when the apostles and prophets and different ones made demands of situations? Did they speak to things? Yes. yes. And they did it in that name. I said in that name. And power was manifested. Can you say glory to God? Glory to God. How did Jesus do the works that he did? How did he experience these manifestations of power? He spoke faith commands. Not just something off the top of his head, but he spoke commands that, that the Father gave him. And when he did, when he uttered them, that's when the power manifested. 
and he's telling us, you are to do the same kind of things. Hallelujah. The same things I did, and here's how you're going to do it. You're going to demand in my name, and I'm going to back you up. Whoo! This is how you get miracles. This is how you have power manifestations. Yes, in services, but in your life, at your home, at your house, in your bedroom, in your car. Right? There will be times when things will come up in you and you'll be prompted to speak. And when you do, it will not be a prayer. You're not talking to the Father and you're not making, certainly not making a request of the enemy. You command it to stop, to change. And Jesus said, I will do it. Whew. How many believe you could count on the word of the Lord? Have you, how, what did he say? I will do it. I will do it. Whatever you demand in my name, I will do it. Whatever you demand in my name, I will do it. I will do it. The head of the church said, I will do it. Now we need to touch on this. Because people have said things and it didn't happen. Does that do away with the Word of God? No. no, it doesn't. I'll mention two big reasons why people would say something and it wouldn't happen. One, we've already noticed it in Mark 11, 23. What did he say? If you'll say, and what? Believe. Not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said come to pass. That happens a lot. People say it but they don't really believe it. They're not really convinced. Hmm? Can you get convinced? Yes. You can. Don't, don't quit. Don't give up. Seek the Lord about it. People have said things they didn't believe. They said, they said things they weren't convinced of. They really did not expect it to happen. They were trying something. And the Lord had told us, no, you, you, don't doubt. You've got to believe it. But secondly, people sometimes try to exercise authority that's not theirs. Beyond their scope of influence. Hmm? Go with me to the book of Acts. And uh, Acts 27. And notice this. Acts 27 and 9. When time was much spent, when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already passed, Paul admonished them and said, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with much hurt, with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. Now, do you know what happened with the rest of the story here? They didn't listen to him. They launched. Everything seemed like it was going good, and then they hit the storm. And they were caught up in the storm, and the Bible said it got to a place where all hope that they should be saved was lost. Why didn't Paul command that storm to cease? Y'all with me or not? Why didn't he? First of all, we got to back up. Would Jesus have commanded the storm to cease? <laughs> Only if he heard the Father. Come on, y'all with me? Right. Only if he heard the Father in his spirit. Why? Because he said, I can't do anything of myself. I only say what I hear him say. I only do what I see him do. Well, well why wouldn't he do that? Not his boat. 
Not his decisions. Come on, can you see that or not? Not his boat. See, we, we talked about this last couple of weeks. Your words carry more weight in your life than anybody else's. They carry more weight than mine. They carry more weight than anybody around you. God himself will let your words win out in his life instead of his. If that's what you choose to speak. Now, that's a giant statement, but we've studied it. We saw it. You remember with the, the children of Israel that he delivered out of Egypt, and at one point after 10 different times of them refusing to say what he said and believe what he said, he said, I'm going to do exactly what you said, your words. Well, that wasn't his will. That wasn't God's plan. But their words won out. And so if you're saying something over another adult person and they're saying something else, guess what's going to happen? Not what you said. What they said. Right? And we don't have authority over everybody everywhere in the world and all of their stuff. We have authority over our stuff. We have authority in our life. Come on, can you see this? And so people have tried to speak and make commands, but it was beyond the scope of their own authority. And so at this point, uh, verse 21, verse 21, after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. And the first thing he said is what? Is what? Sirs, you should listen to me. Is that right? Now here, if they had listened to him. Now, oh man, there's so much revelation here. Would you say that them going through this storm was the will of God? Yeah, but it got recorded in the Bible. Huh? Read the rest of this. What would have happened if they had listened? And not have loosed from Crete and have gained this harm and loss. Is he saying they would not have experienced this harm and loss? If they'd listened to him, which was listening to God, because he didn't say that of himself. He got that in his spirit. So much so he went to them and told them, but they thought he's just a wide eyed preacher. He don't know. He's not a sailor. He's not a weatherman. And didn't realize in ignoring him, they ignored God and plunged right on into it. Well, then the ship wasn't saved. The, uh, Cargo wasn't saved, and their lives would have been lost too, except for the mercy of God. Right? While he was in the hull of that ship praying, an angel showed up and basically told him, God's heard your prayer, and he's given you everybody that's with you. They should have been glad that preacher was on that boat. Right? But that's why he didn't just get up and rebuke it. Now, there were other times he exercised authority. He made commands. He, he made demands in the name of Jesus. But here's, can you see these two big reasons we're talking about why people have said stuff and it didn't come to pass? One, they said it, but they didn't really believe it. Two, they said it, but it was outside the scope of their authority. They're trying to make things happen for somebody else contrary to the things that they're saying. And that's not going to happen. If God's not going to make, force his words off on somebody, he's not going to force your words off on somebody. But it's still true that Jesus said, if you believe on me, the works I did, you'll do too. And whatever you demand in my name, I will do it. Oh, friend. There ought to be times all along in our life that something bad's going on and we, we're checking our heart, we're checking our heart and the Spirit of God prompts us, say this, hallelujah, and we stand, we command that thing to stop. We command it, rebuke it, and when you do it, Jesus said, I will do it. I, oh, hallelujah, whatever you require and command in my name, I will will do it. Stand on your feet. Amen. I would say this is a message that's worth us listening to over and over and over again. Amen. 
don't let this be the only time that, that we listen to it, okay? Uh, it, it's so rich and it's so vital for, for where we are now. And, you know, the wonderful thing about authority is uh, we can never exercise authority over another person's will, right? We know this. But in ministering to someone, and, and especially um, in ministering to someone with their needs, and uh, a, a younger Christian or, or whatnot, if, if they're saying something else and we're trying to say what God is saying, he just said this, their words, what they say, they believe, and their words are going to win out every time. But if they come and they submit themselves to your authority, you can exercise, we can exercise our authority over the situation with them. Do you understand? It's not exercising authority over their will, uh, but it is exercising our authority in the spirit realm regarding whatever the infirmity is that they're dealing with. All right. Amen. Amen. I want to share this with you real fast, and then we're going to close. Um, and it's just a testimony that I shared actually last night uh, during prayer. But I wanted to read these, uh, this verse uh, to you. It's in Matthew 8. I did not give this to Brad. Uh, but you can get your Bibles and your um, devices out and look at it with me. Matthew 8 and verse 16 and 17 and I'm reading in the Amplified here, it says, But when evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he drove out the spirits with what? A word. That's right. He drove out the spirits with a word and restored to health all who were sick. Boy, that's good news. Verse 17, it says, And thus he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, he said, he himself took in order to carry away our weaknesses and infirmities, and he bore away our diseases. Praise the Lord. So over the, the course of these, these um, last several years especially, but Landon was talking about that we call those things that be not as though they were. Is that right? Uh, that's what faith is. We call those things that be not as though as though they were. So uh, I've been more and more diligent, more and more diligent about calling my body strong, about calling my body healthy. Spirit, soul, and body, I call you strong in the name of Jesus. My mind, I call you strong in the name of Jesus. Every organ in my body, Every nerve, every bone, my blood, I call you healed and whole, strong in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, nowhere in the Bible does it say, and, and I hope that you don't subscribe to this because this is the way of the world, that as we grow older, we're expected to get decrepit and weak and barely able to get around. Uh, the words out there are our minds. You just never know because of all the disease out there, if we're going to lose our minds or not. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. And so we need to be subscribing to what God says. This verse right here says that he himself took in order to carry away our weaknesses and infirmities, and he bore away our diseases. He, 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 he took upon himself your weaknesses and your infirmities. And what did it say? What does the scripture say that he did with it? He carried them away. So if he carried your weaknesses away, if he carried your infirmities away, if he bore away your diseases, then we are out of line with the will of God and with the truth of God to call our bodies weak or sick. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, as I said, I have just been more diligent and more diligent and more diligent in doing this. And the last, uh, the last several weeks, I've had something going on in my shoulder, whatever. It just, uh, it, w it was painful when I would move it a certain way. I was laying in bed the other night, sound asleep, and I woke up to this pain. The, the pain woke me up and how I moved it. And uh, like I said, I wasn't thinking about anything because I was sound asleep. 
Amen. But as soon as I woke up and that happened, I said, shoulder in the name of Jesus, be, and I honestly don't remember. And you say, well, really, how do you not remember? Because you know what? There's, it didn't come out of my head. It came out of my spirit. It came out of my spirit. Life words. And I said, shoulder be loosed or, or something like that. And immediately, this is, this is, what, this is what happens when, when we say what the Father says. And the Father was saying it in my spirit, man. And I opened my mouth and I gave voice to it. Shoulder, be loosed in Jesus' name. I went like that and I turned over. And I mean, I'm telling you, there ain't a lick of pain. There's not a lick of pain. There's not a lick of pain. And I give God the glory. Hallelujah. Like he said, if a fever can hear, a shoulder can hear. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Stand to your feet. Do you want? Yep. All right. Yeah, stand up. Let's close real quick. I wanted to share, um, Courtney had just texted me this, actually. This, this is, how many of you, um, you learn better when there's like real life examples of what you hear in the word? So uh, this happened years ago. Many of you may know, but when our daughter Hartley was in an accident back here, there was something, and it was a, and it was a big deal. There was something that Courtney said at the time, and she, she had texted me this. There was something she said at the time. She said, she will live and not die in Jesus' name. And it's really cool because what we just heard is Jesus saying, anything that you ask in my name, and Brother Keith was talking about, really that word is translated demand. Anything you demand in my name, I will do it. And so the cool thing about that is that didn't, she didn't just make that up. So in a, in a situation where something's going on like that, you better believe that when you say something like that, you, you're, you're not crying. You're not just trying to eke it out. You're saying it from a place of that just came into your spirit from the Lord and you're boldly declaring it in Jesus' name. You can't say that through tears and there be doubt there. Right? And so... She said she will live and not die in Jesus' name. And what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? He said, anything that you demand in my name, I will do it for you. It's a testimony. She lived and she didn't die. She lived. Trust me, she's alive. But I'm talking about a real, this is why it is so important that the word of God gets downloaded in your spirit. So in times like that, that you have something, the Holy Spirit has something to bring up in your spirit that you can boldly declare in Jesus' name, and what will he do? He'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. He'll do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, We just plead and apply the blood of Jesus over that word that's been downloaded in our hearts tonight, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to apply it tonight, tomorrow, and every day going forward. And we thank you. Uh, Jesus, for your word, that you will do whatever we ask in your name. Thank you for it. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you guys Sunday. Invite somebody.